So now that we've looked at the law of demand and supply and see how they interact together to form the market equilibrium and determine the equilibrium price and quantity in a market economy, we are now going to turn our attention to government intervention in the economy. In a market-based economy, it is the interaction of these market forces of supply and demand that ultimately determine the price a good is sold at. And it determines, then, the quantity that is demanded and supplied at that particular price. But there are times when the government intervenes on behalf of either consumers or producers to establish either a maximum price or a minimum price that a good may be sold for that is different from the market equilibrium. And in this module, Module 8, we will look at these government price controls that sometimes creep up that are called price ceilings and price floors. So in this module, I will begin by explaining why economists are often deeply skeptical and troubled of any government attempt to intervene in the markets and to establish these kinds of price controls. But when the government does, there are winners and losers. Sometimes the government intervenes to establish a maximum price to benefit the consumers of a good or service. That is called a price ceiling. Other times the government intervenes to establish a minimum price that a good may be sold for to benefit producers, and that is called a price floor. And so we will identify who benefits and who loses from these price controls. So now, let's start by asking this question. Why does the government even bother to try to control prices in a market economy? Well, there are a number of reasons for this. Sometimes, the efficient outcome that is established in the market is judged to be unfair to some groups, either unfair to consumers or unfair to producers. This is what we call economic equity, and it's one of the goals that we have that a market economy isn't very good at establishing. Market economies are very good at achieving economic efficiency, but not so much economic equity, which is defined as fairness, although as we know, fairness is a subjective term, and what is fair to one group is not always fair to another, but societally we try to determine what might be fair, and if a market outcome is not determined to be fair, then there may be a cry for government intervention to benefit either the consumers or producers of a product by establishing these minimum or maximum prices. So these are usually done to help groups that are disadvantaged and poor and maybe struggling to begin with. So how do we deal with this? Well, the government establishes a price control. See, the market price moves to the level at which the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. But as I've said, this equilibrium price does not necessarily please the buyers. Buyers would always like a lower price, or the sellers who would always like a higher price. Therefore, government sometimes, under pressure from these groups of people, intervenes to regulate prices by imposing these price controls. And a price control is a legal restriction on how high a market price is allowed to go or how low a market price is allowed to go. So price controls are enacted by governments in response to political pressures from buyers and sellers. We define a price ceiling as the maximum price sellers are allowed to charge for a good or a service, and that is established to benefit the consumers of a good when it is determined that buyers are paying too much for something at the market price, or the government can establish a price floor, which is the minimum price buyers are required to pay for a good or a service, and this is done to benefit producers or the sellers of a good when they feel that the price they are receiving in the market is too low. So the first thing we'll deal with are what we call price ceilings. A price ceiling is a maximum price sellers are allowed to charge for a good. And, as I said before, who do they benefit? Who would want such a thing? Consumers, buyers of a good. People who believe that they are paying too much for something would like a good or service. Think about this. What goods or services do you consider to be unfairly expensive? Maybe you think the price of gasoline is too much, or maybe you think the price you pay for college tuition is too much. 
So in these cases, you might think, well, maybe the government should establish a maximum price that I pay for my gasoline. Maybe the government should establish a maximum price that I should pay for tuition because the market equilibrium price is too high. So price ceilings are typically imposed during crises. And one thing that I want to establish here at the outset is that in the United States, in our market system, the government doesn't intervene very often to establish either price ceilings or price floors. They tend to be fairly rare occurrences in our system. We tend to favor the idea of market equilibrium determining, determining the prices that goods sell for. But when the government does intervene, it's typically imposed because there is some kind of a crisis, a war, a harvest failure, a natural disaster of some kind. Because these events often lead to shortages of goods and services that can lead to sudden price increases that hurt many people but produce big gains for a lucky few who can sell their products for extremely high prices. So some examples of this would be the U.S. government imposing ceilings on aluminum and steel during World War II or rent control on apartments in New York City. Those are examples of this. So if the equilibrium, equilibrium price is considered too high, then a price ceiling must be set below the equilibrium price. A price ceiling set above the equilibrium price has no effect. And if you think about it logically, that makes sense, because if you set a maximum price below equilibrium, the tendency would be if you remove the ceiling for the price to go to equilibrium. But a price is not going to go higher than equilibrium on its own. So if you set the maximum price above equilibrium, it has no effect. So the only effective price ceiling is one set below the equilibrium price. So let's look at an example of a government price control. The New York City Council establishes price controls for certain apartments in New York City. Not all apartments. Many apartments are sold at market rate. But if they were all sold at market rate, the monthly rent for an apartment would be so expensive that many people would be priced out of the market and wouldn't be able to afford the rent. So some apartments are set aside as being rent control, and the landlords are restricted in the amount of monthly rent that they are allowed to charge for the apartment. They're not allowed to charge the market rate, or what the maximum price is a buyer would we be willing to pay. So here you see a table that shows the dem demand and supply schedules in the New York City market for apartments. And when we look at that, we establish the quantity demanded at different monthly rents, and from that demand schedule, we draw the demand curve for apartments in New York City. And then we add to that the quantity of apartments that landlords are willing to supply at different prices, and we graph the data from the supply schedule and draw an upward sloping supply curve. And where those two intersect is the equilibrium point. We can see that the market equilibrium for apartments in New York City would be equivalent to $1,000 a month per rent, and at that price, $2 million people would be willing to pay $1,000 a month, and 2 million landlords would be willing to rent their apartment for $1,000 for, for a month. And so every buyer that wants to rent at $1,000 would find an apartment, and every landlord that wants to rent one for $1,000 would find someone to rent it to. And so the quantity demanded is exactly equal to the quantity supplied, and that is market equilibrium. But Many renters might be enraged at this high price. People that can't afford to pay $1,000 a month or aren't willing to may successfully lobby the city government for a law that says you can't rent apartments for more than a certain amount of money. So what might that be? Well, maybe they lobby the city government to say the maximum rent for an apartment should be only $800 a month. Okay, so the city council passes that law, and that's good, right? Because the price of apartments, the rent for apartments, comes down. And many people say, oh, that's a good thing, right? Cheaper apartments. But let's look at the effects of a price ceiling. 
The first effect that we can see when the government establishes a price ceiling is that it creates a shortage of approximately 400,000 apartments. Now, why is that the case? Well, because remember that when the price comes down, as the price falls, the law of supply says the quantity supplied will fall, right? So the quantity supplied goes from point E to point A, and landlords will be unwilling to supply as many apartments as they were when the market rent was higher. As a matter of fact, when the price falls to $800 a month in rent, landlords will only supply 1.8 million apartments instead of 2 million. But the law of demand says that when the price falls, the quantity demanded rises. And so on the demand curve, we go from point E to point B. And at the lower price, more people will be willing to pay it, and so the quantity demanded will rise from 2 million to 2.2 million. But we, you'll notice that if we draw a horizontal line across from the $800 point, we intersect the demand curve and the supply curve at two different points, not at the same point. So here, at the lower price, quantity demanded is not equal to quantity supplied. The quantity demanded at $800 is 2.2 million apartments. The quantity supplied is only 1.8 million apartments, and that's a difference of 400,000 apartments. What does that mean? That means that there will be 400,000 people that are willing to pay $800 for an apartment, and they won't find one because there won't be landlords willing to supply them at that point. Now, the first 1.8 million people to find an apartment at that price will get one. But there will be 400,000 people that won't be lucky enough to find an apartment at that price, and they won't get one even though they were willing to pay that price. So one of the biggest effects of a price ceiling is that it creates a shortage of a good. The price ceiling shows us that the quantity demanded will always be greater than the quantity supplied. So now is this so bad? Well, maybe this isn't a bad thing. Aren't renters helped by this lower price? After all, they're only paying $800 for the apartment instead of $1,000. Well, the answer is it depends on which renter you are. If you're one of the 1.8 million people that finds an apartment for $800 a month, then you're lucky and good for you. And this is good for you then. But if you're one of those 400,000 people that's willing to pay $800 for an apartment, but you can't find one because there aren't any available at that price, then you're not so lucky. So it really depends on who you are. There are winners and losers in this. And that is a big effect of a price ceiling, creating a shortage in the market. But there are other negative forces at work as well. Price ceilings cause inefficiency in the market. The market equilibrium price is the efficient outcome because every buyer finds a seller and every seller finds a buyer. And everyone willing to pay the market price gets something. Everyone willing to sell at that price gets to sell it. And that's what we call the most efficient outcome. There are no buyers left looking for a seller at that price and there are no sellers left looking for a buyer at the market price. But when we lower the price below it, creating a price ceiling, now we have inefficient allocation to consumers. What does that mean? Well, it means that the apartments don't necessarily go to the people who value them the most. People who want an apartment very badly and are willing to pay a higher rent to be able to get it might not get one. And those who don't care as much, they care relatively little about the apartment, and they're only willing to pay a low price to get it, not the higher market price, may actually end up getting it. So the people who value it the most don't always get it, and people who value it less sometimes do get it. The apartments don't go to the people who value them the most, and that's an inefficient outcome. We call that inefficient allocation to consumers. You know, suppose that Stan was our 400,000 first renter. Now, he would not have paid you know, $800 or $1,000 for an apartment before the price control, but maybe now he is one of the lucky ones that gets an apartment for $800.
Julia, however, was our second potential renter, and she would have been willing to pay $1,000 for an apartment, but now she can't find one. So this is one way to define inefficiency. A market or an economy is inefficient if there are missed opportunities. Some people could be made better off without making other people worse off. This is inefficient because Stan could rent an apartment from Julia for $1,000 a month and both of them would win, right? He could rent it to her for that. And they would both win, because he would get extra money, and she'd get the apartment that she's willing to pay for. So this is exactly the reallocation that improves someone without harming someone else. Another problem with price ceilings is that there are, there are wasted resources. This means that people spend money and expend effort in order to deal with the shortages caused by the price ceiling. Imagine... If there's a shortage of apartments, then there are a lot of people that are going to spend time and effort driving around town, looking at different apartments, trying to find one, searching online, and using time that could be spent doing other things. They could be working, having some leisure time, and th this creates missed opportunities because they're spending that time looking for an apartment that's hard to find. These missed opportunities create more inefficiency to the price control, and so resources are wasted. Another problem is that we may get inefficiently low quality. Landlords, in this case, offer low quality apartments at the price ceiling, even though buyers would be willing to pay for a higher quality apartment at a, at a higher price. Landlords may cut corners on the quality of the apartment, maintaining the apartment, the features of the apartment, because that costs money. And so the apartments would be cheaper and not as nice. We might get more apartments that make us unhealthy because they're not keeping them up. Um, so if the price was allowed to rise, then they would put more money into those apartments, creating higher quality apartments that people actually want. So it leads to inefficiently low quality. And then finally, price ceilings can lead to black markets. Why? Because those 400,000 people that can't find an apartment but are willing to pay more for one, more than $800 a month, maybe they go into the black market to find an apartment. A black market is a market in which goods or services are bought and sold illegally. And if there's a legal price ceiling, then paying more than $800 a month for this rent would be illegal. But maybe there's a wink and a nod. Maybe someone goes to a landlord and they say, okay, um, I'll rent this apartment from you and I'll sneak an extra $200 to you a month if you rent it to me. It'll look like I'm paying $800 a month, but I'll pay you $200 for something else, and then you're getting your $1,000. So this happens either because it is illegal to sell a good at all or because the price is charged or legally prohibited by price ceiling, but people that are desperate may go into the black market to do so, and then we have illegal activity. So the question is, then why do we have price ceilings? If there are all these bad negative outcomes, why do we do it? Well, because a group of people may have significant political power, and they put pressure on elected officials to give them some kind of a benefit. Price ceilings are enacted because they do benefit some consumers, and these consumers may have the political clout to persuade government officials that the equilibrium price is taking advantage of them. This is a normative argument, not a positive argument. A second reason might be that be when price ceilings have been in effect for a long time, buyers may not have a realistic idea of what would happen without them. Maybe they think if they're removed that the price would skyrocket when in fact the market price might not actually go up by that much. But they're afraid to remove the ceiling for what might happen in the market. And finally, Government officials that actually pass these price ceilings don't have good economic understanding or good economic analysis. They don't understand as much as you do about economics. They often don't understand basic supply and demand analysis. And so they don't understand the economic inefficiencies that come from price controls. And so they enact them to win favor with a group of people and these consumers whom the ceiling helps. The other type of price control that the government sometimes enacts is what we call a price floor. 
A price floor is a legal minimum price that buyers are required to pay for a good. So rather than favoring consumers, price floors are designed to favor sellers or producers of a good. And so sometimes governments intervene to push market prices up instead of down. If the equilibrium price is considered too low for the sellers, a price floor is set above the equilibrium price. Now, remember that a price floor that is set below the equilibrium price would be useless. It would have no effect. Because if you remove the price floor, the price would go down to equilibrium, but it wouldn't go down any further. So if you set a floor below equilibrium, it has no effect at all. It only has an effect if it's above equilibrium. The minimum wage is a, an example of a price floor. It's a legal floor on the wage rate and what employers are allowed to pay when you sell your labor to them, which would be the market rate of labor if the floor was removed. And just like price ceilings, price floors are intended to help some people. Who are these people intended to help? Teenagers, low-income people that struggle to get jobs uh, and try, are trying to afford the basic necessities of life. So they're intended to help these people by raising their wages, but the minimum wage and other price floors can generate predictable and undesirable side effects just like price ceilings can. Okay? The minimum wage shown here is a legal floor on the equilibrium wage rate, which is the market price of labor. Here, what you see is the opposite of what you saw with a price ceiling. The supply of workers willing to, er, the, yeah, willing to work at that higher wage increases. Because when the wage goes up, more people are willing to say, yeah, I'm willing to sell my labor at that higher price. But employers look at it differently. They're the ones who are demanding labor because they hire labor. So when the wage goes up and they have to pay their workers more, they say, well, I'm not, I can't afford to hire as many workers. So I'm not going to demand as many workers. I'm not going to hire as many. So here what you see is that when the wage goes from W0 to W1, which is the price floor, the minimum wage, you see that the quantity supplied, the number of workers willing to work, is at L1 is much greater than the number of employers that are willing to hire those workers at L2. And so this creates what we call a surplus rather than a shortage. This is a surplus. We have a surplus of workers. So let's look at another example of this. Let's look at the market for butter in the absence of government controls. So we have our demand schedule and our supply schedule, and we graph our demand and supply curves, and we can see that when we do that, the equilibrium price of butter in the absence of any price control would be that butter would sell for a dollar per pound and 10 million pounds of butter would be bought and sold. Everyone who wants to buy butter, willing and able to buy butter for a dollar, would find someone to sell it to them for that price, and everyone that wants to sell butter for a dollar would find a buyer. That's what equilibrium is. Every seller finds a buyer, every buyer finds a seller. There are no, no leftover sellers looking for buyers and no leftover buyers looking for sellers at that price. But what happens if the government says, well, dairy farmers are getting too little money for their butter, and it's unfair to them, and they should receive more income for every pound of butter that they sell. And so the government establishes a price floor, which is a minimum price established above the equilibrium price. Well, we can see here that a couple of things happen. You know, the dairy farmers, they were enraged by that low price of a dollar per pound for butter, and so they successfully lobbied the government to get a law that says you can't sell butter for less than a dollar twenty per pound. And that's good for sellers, right? That's good for the dairy farmers. Well, you would think so, right? Because they're getting a higher price. But again, it depends. Are you one of the lucky dairy farmers that finds a buyer for your butter at that price? Because two things happen when you raise the price. When the price goes up, the quantity supplied rises. So more dairy farmers are willing to supply more butter. And the, uh, the quantity of butter supplied goes from E to B, or from 10 million pounds of butter to now 12 million pounds of butter are produced. But can they sell all that butter? No, because when the price rises, the law of demand says the quantity demanded falls. 
And at that higher price, fewer w- people are willing and able to buy butter for a dollar. As a matter of fact, now at $1.20, only 9 million pounds of butter will be sold. So what happens? 12 million pounds of butter are produced, but only 9 million pounds of butter are sold. And now we have a surplus, the difference between A and B, of 3 million pounds of butter caused by the price floor. What happens to this butter? Well, maybe it rots. Maybe it goes bad. It spoils. Or maybe they, it finds its way into your school lunch because the government donates excess butter that can't be sold in the market to school lunch programs. There are different things that can be done. But price floors, the first negative effect is that they lead to a surplus. That's an excess quantity supplied, too much supply of a good. Just like when we had a price ceiling, we had a shortage, too much demand. Now with a price floor, we have a surplus, too much supply. And quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. In this case, a surplus of 3 million pounds of butter. Now, during the 1930s, and and I talked about how how do we get rid of this excess supply, and sometimes when we're dealing with farm products, what the government does is they take the excess surplus, and instead of letting it rot and ruin, they'll give it away. And oftentimes, they're given to schools to reduce the price of school lunches. Um, So during the 1930s, to aid farmers, the U.S. government imposed price floors on agricultural products like beef and sugar and pork to create a surplus. And the government reduced the surplus by paying farmers not to grow crops. That's how they reduced supply. Um, But the government, there are a couple of things they can do. They can pay farmers not to produce this excess quantity, and so that is one way of reducing the supply, but sometimes they let them produce it, and the government just buys up the surplus, taking it off the market, and then they give that extra food to schools as free or cheap lunches, and that's where a lot of the food comes from, from these government programs that are meant to help farmers. Now, We said a surplus is one way, you know, this persistent surplus that results from a price floor is one thing that creates a problem, but price floors also cause inefficiency, just like price ceilings created inefficiency, because we are no longer selling at the efficient outcome, which is the equilibrium price. And one of these problems is that you have inefficiencies that resemble those created by the shortage. So what is one of those? Well, one is that we end up with an efficiently low quantity of the good. Since a price floor raises the price of a good to consumers, quantity demanded falls. So the quantity that is actually bought and sold falls because the the only quantity that is sold is the quantity that is demanded. So that creates a loss to society, right? Because society would prefer a higher quantity, right? But we actually get an inefficiently low quantity that is sold. So that's a loss. Another one is that we get inefficient allocation of sales among sellers. Those who would be willing to sell the good at the lowest price are not always those who actually manage to sell it. Suppose that Susan is not a very efficient dairy farmer, and she couldn't sell butter at a dollar per pound, but she can sell it at a dollar twenty per pound. Well, she is lucky enough to get one of the few buyers, right? But let's say that John is very efficient, and he could sell butter at a dollar per pound, but he's unlucky, and he doesn't get a buyer at a dollar twenty. Well, the price floor has now just enabled a less efficient seller to make a sale. Someone who produces something at a higher cost to the to society ends up getting the sale, and someone who could produce it at a lower cost doesn't get the sale, and so that's an inefficient outcome. The right sellers don't get the sales. Someone who has higher costs gets the sale, and someone with lower costs doesn't get the sale. 
So the price floor has just enabled a less efficient seller to make a sale and might force an efficient seller out of the market. And that's a loss to society. So we have inefficiently low quantity of goods sold. We have inefficient allocation of sales among sellers. We have surpluses. But we also have wasted resources. Government price floors set about the equilibrium price set above the equilibrium price, rather, cause surpluses which the government may be required to buy and destroy. Well, that's a waste. Minimum wages result in fewer jobs available, and so would-be workers waste time searching for a job. Think about that. If, you know, all of the workers that want a job at minimum wage can't find one, you know, if you're lucky enough to find a job at the higher minimum wage, then you're good, that's good. But there will be other workers that want to work for the higher wage that won't find one. And so now you have to spend your time driving around town, filling out applications, looking at different places, trying to find a job, searching online, and that those are all wasted resources. Now, in the term, in going back to the butter example, what do we do with the surplus butter? Well, as we said, sometimes it goes to waste, even if the government purchases it purchases it. It doesn't even always go to schools. So you can have a lot of waste. You can also have inefficiently high quality. Okay, that's why the airplane is pictured here, because that was true in the 1970s when the government set limits on airfares. It doesn't do that anymore, but it regulated the airlines in the 1970s and set a minimum fare that could be charged by the airline. So that led the airlines to offer inefficiently high quality of services on their airlines that consumers really didn't want but ended up getting anyway when they would have preferred to pay a lower fare and maybe give up some of those frills and extras. So sellers offer high quality goods at a high price even though buyers maybe would prefer fewer frills, lower quality, as long as they could get it at a lower price. You know, at that time, in the 1970s, the airlines used to provide everyone with a full dinner or a full lunch. They don't do that anymore. Um, you, you're lucky if you get a bag of peanuts when you fly, if you fly in, in coach. But, uh, you know, a lot of uh, travelers said, hey, I'd rather pay less money for an airline ticket to get to my destination and, and bring my own food or not have them feed me a fancy meal just so I can get a lower fare rather than paying a higher fare and getting a meal that's fancy that I don't really want. So the high price may induce airlines to provide all of these extra frills and or you know taco suppliers to provide extravagantly expensive ingredients in their tacos that would be unprofitable at the lower market price. When you know, taco consumers would probably just rather have a low-priced taco without the fancy bells and whistles and all the extras. If they were really wanting expensive ingredients, their preferences would have been reflected in a steeper demand curve to begin with, and the market price would be higher. The same thing with airline customers. The, the final problem that, you know, that price floors cause is inefficiency and illegal activity. You, you end up getting bribery of sellers or bribery of government officials. Um, people that want to work for less than the minimum wage will often work off the books because there is a surplus of labor and they'll work for less money but they won't report it to the government. Minimum wage laws, as we've said, are an example of price floors. In, in Europe, they have relatively high minimum wages compared to the United States and that has led to higher levels of unemployment in black markets and labor. In contrast, the minimum wage in the United States is lower and set closer to the equilibrium wage, and labor is relatively more productive in the United States as a result. So price floors lead to this inefficient allocation of sales among sellers, those who would be willing to sell the good at the lowest price and not those who, uh, always those who actually manage to sell it. It leads to inefficiency in the quantity of goods, um, in the quality of goods, rather, I should say, that are offered. Sellers offer high-quality goods at a high price, even though buyers would prefer a lower quality at a lower price. We've already talked about these two things. So why do we have price floors? Before I summarize, why do we have price floors? Well, for a very similar reason to why we have price ceilings. Okay, Price floors do benefit some producers, and those producers may have the political clout to persuade government officials that the equilibrium price is unfairly low. 
Again, it's a normative argument, but if they're persuasive with government officials, then they'll get the price floor. Price floors create a persistent surplus of the good. Inefficiencies are rising, are, are inefficiently low quantity, inefficient allocation of sales among sellers, and uh, you know, wasted resources, inefficiently high level of quality goods, and all sorts of things. So, yeah, we, we get these floors often because of this political clout. So let's summarize what we've learned in this module. We've, we've looked at times when the government intervenes in the market to establish a, a price control. And so even when a market is efficient, governments will often intervene to pursue greater fairness or to please a powerful interest group. Interventions can take the form of price controls, which generate predictable and undesirable side effects. As we've seen, a price ceiling is a maximum market price below the equilibrium price to benefit successful buyers, but it creates persistent shortages and leads to many inefficiencies that we talked about. A price floor is a minimum market price above the equilibrium price that benefits successful sellers but creates persistent surplus. And price floors lead to all other kinds of inefficiencies that we've talked about as well. This is the end of our look at Module 8, Price Controls, Ceilings, and Floors.